Okay, welcome back. So let's pick up from where I stopped. I was talking about uh, a, a replica of what we see from Acts chapter 6, where they chose people to do the daily works. The same thing we see here. Uh, Moses, he chose leaders who would look after the work uh, and the menial tasks during that time. So it was the point is, it is the Holy Spirit who gave them the wisdom to do that. Okay, let's go to the next portion, Acts 7, 51 and 55. Acts 7, 51 and verse 55. His, his thickness and uncircumcised in heart and ears, he do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did so. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted. Go to verse 55. Um, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Yeah. So again, we just talked about this. Two things we see here. Stephen has, they have caught Stephen. They made him stand there. He's given this full sermon. And he says, you stiff-necked people, you resist the Holy Spirit. And then out of that, they got even more angry. And here's what happened. Verse 54. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. Again, full of the Holy Spirit. These words are so constant. You see it all through the book of Acts. Full of the Holy Spirit looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. What a powerful, powerful encounter. Now, where was Stephen? Physically, where was he? He was going to get martyred. But when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, they were throwing stones on him. Now, these are professional stoners. Jews were professionals in killing people, meaning in stoning people. They didn't take pebbles and throw on them. Stoning to death was one of the most common methods used uh, if a person was found uh, in sin, breaking the laws. right? And that's why they brought this woman who was adulterous said, the law says we got to stone her to death. It was the law. Right? So they were used to it. It was not something new to them. So they took stones and it is a painful death. Isn't it? Is it a painful death? Definitely. Right. Imagine big boulders of stones coming and hitting your body and it's painful. But look at the response of Stephen. Stephen is not saying, oh, Lord, please. One stone has already hit my head. Now another stone is hitting my chest. Is he doing all that? Full of the Holy Spirit. He looked up and God gave him this vision. Remember what Peter said? What did Peter say? Your men will dream dreams and see visions. So here's Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. The pain, the physical pain is not, not important there. It was not taking control. He's saying, hey, you guys are throwing stones at me, but look at me. I see the heavens are open. And the Son of Man is standing at the right hand of the Father. What a, what a powerful. And Saul is there, standing there, giving approval of all of this. I'm sure Saul would have thought, something is wrong in this. He's not crying. He's not, he's not weary. But what a glorious death. Somewhere, something would have happened to Saul. But anyways, the point here is, filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God. You and I, in our seasons of chan, nobody may stone us, but people may persecute us, people may ridicule us, people may mock us. We go through seasons of ups and downs and grieving and sadness and, and all kinds of seasons we go in. We can look up to Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he will give us, he will show us his glory. He will show us. And when I'm saying show us his glory, don't be waiting for a dream. Lord, where's the glory? Where's the glory? No. Christ in me, the hope of? Right? 
So what do we see here? What a powerful encounter. Look, he said, I see heaven open. Did others see it? No. Because they were, they were in the natural. They were not filled of the Holy Spirit. I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him to death. They didn't say, oh, you're seeing heaven. We also want to see heaven. They didn't say that. They closed their ears and said, you're talking blasphemy. But here's the difference. When you and I are filled with the Holy Spirit, God will open our spiritual eyes that we will see dreams, we will see visions, we will see the glory of God and He's able to do it. He's able to do it. This is the only verse in the entire Bible where it says Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father. Everywhere else, Jesus is seated on the right hand of the Father. The Son of God is seated at the right hand of the Father. This is the only place where Jesus is standing. It was as if to say that God is standing to honor, to honor the life of this martyr of the New Testament, the first martyr of the church of Jesus. Right? But what's important is he, that physical pain was not that took took precedence here. I saw the heavens open, and the Son of Man was standing there. So in our seasons, we have a choice to look at what is happening around us and weep and moan and cry and be weary. I'm not saying we don't cry. I'm not saying we don't moan. We go through all of that, but our eyes must be fixed on Him. How do I fix my eyes on Him? On Jesus, I need to fill myself with the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Help me not to look at the things that are around me and put my trust in Him in all of this. But help me to go back to the Word. And Jesus said, don't store up riches on earth, but store up riches in heaven where moth and rust cannot take it, cannot destroy it. Right? So that's what the Holy Spirit does. So even when we go to sleep, as we pray, Pray and ask God, God, give me a dream. Give me something that I can that speak to me through a dream, speak through me through a vision, minister to me. Holy Spirit, give me, give me some idea, give me a thought that I should do this. And He's willing to do it, right? Because that's one of the ways the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Right. Everyone with me? Okay, Acts 8. In Acts 8, 10 through 20. Again, we see here Simon the Sorcerer. Now, we won't go through the entire portion, but let me give you a background. People are seeing all these miracles, right? And Simon is a sorcerer. A sorcerer is a person who uses witchcraft to get work done. Remember, there's God has given us power, given, there's God's power, there's also the enemy who's working. And God has also given him certain powers, and he uses those powers, right? Remember in, uh, in the book of Samuel, uh, was that Second Samuel, I guess, uh, where uh, you know, King Saul goes to the witch of Endor and says, I want to talk to Samuel about something. But Samuel is already dead and gone, right? And she, uh, Samuel, King Saul says, I want to talk to Samuel. And the witch says, OK, I'll bring up the spirit of Samuel. That was. So it was not like that was Samuel, that was Samuel, right? That was an evil spirit disguising himself. Now, the same way, Simon was a sorcerer who was making good money. Probably he was healing people. Probably he was, you know, prophesying, right? It says that he, he prophesied over people and people believed in him. But now he's seeing something different here. This spirit that these disciples are working on is a greater spirit than this sorcery spirit. So Simon the sorcerer goes to, goes to Peter and says, Okay, Peter, I like what you have. I've got a big bank account. Tell me how much you need. I'll give you the money. But I want some of that spirit. Okay, that's the background. Now, Peter answered, verse 20. 
chapter 8, Acts 8, verse 20. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Simon the sorcerer answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. When they had tested and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel, many Samaritan villages. Now, what can we get from here? As you know, the work of the enemy is to do a counterfeit. So, uh, how many of you know what's a counterfeit? A replica, right? So, for example, I have a hundred rupee note, which is an original note, and I have a fake hundred rupee note. I'm going, I go to the, you know, maybe a supermarket and I, I go there, I buy some things and I give him the fake hundred rupee note. It could be that that person is not going to check it. I may just walk out of there. Sometimes I myself may not know that it's a fake note. And there are ways to check it. I, I don't know what they do. They check, they hold it up and they see whether there's that, those markings, those lines. So there are ways, but it, if when you look at it, it looks exactly the same. Exactly the same. Remember in Revelations we talked about last Sunday? The Antichrist, the beast, comes in a white horse. Exactly what Jesus will do in Revelations 19. He comes on a white horse. So remember, the, see, the devil is, he will do the replica of what God is doing. He doesn't have any new ideas. He uses new, new things, new people and all of that. But his way of dealing with people is the same since the beginning of time. Eve. You, you eat the apple. No. Did God really tell you that? Same thing he's doing now. No. Did God really tell you if you don't, if you believe, if you believe in Jesus, your sins are forgiven? Same thing. There's no difference. So the enemy is a counterfeit. And so we see here, Simon the sorcerer is a counterfeit. But Peter, full of the spirit, recognized it. What does he do? He says, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with the money, you have no part or share in the ministry. Now, uh, be attentive to this portion. Because your heart is not right before God. The Holy Spirit is the discerner of people's heart. We see that here. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can speak to us and and when we look at people, when we talk to people, we will understand what's happening in their heart. He's able to do that. He, he discerns our heart. He understands this heart. Now, can you think of this in the Old Covenant? David. King David did what? He committed adultery. Right? Now, in the Old Testament, to commit adultery was one of the most, it's a, one of the seven deadly sins. It's a big sin in the eyes of God. But God calls David a man after my own heart. Why would he do that? Right? Yes, he repented. There was something that God saw in David's heart. That that repentance that happened, it was not a show. Even though he was the king at that time, he was willing to take correction from Nathan the prophet. And he put on sackcloth and ashes and he wept. And he asked God for forgiveness. Being a king of Israel. Now, when David was a king, he was one of the mightiest kings. right? No one was as mighty as the nation of Israel when David was the king. Fought many battles, won many kingdoms. And here you have this man. He's committed adultery. He could have said, Nathan, you know what? When you were still deciding to become a prophet, God chose me when I was looking after sheep. You know, Goliath, how tall he was? With one stone, I killed the fellow. Did he say all that? David didn't say, you know, it took me how many years to come to this place? Do you see this throne here? 
this is the king's palace and this is the king's throne and i am the king you are telling me what to do no david the the words of god through the prophet nathan just pierced his heart he said yes i have sinned against god and david could have taken it the other way right but he didn't that's why that's why king saul had a problem and the holy spirit you know the spirit of god left him because he decided that i am going to pursue david and i am going to kill him that was in his mind he was jealous it was not going to go god said i cannot i cannot deal with your hard heartedness if you're like this did you ever think of this you know i always think of this what if king saul said okay god i'm sorry i made the biggest mistake of my life please restore my kingdom i will take david i will train him i will train him now he's only 17 years old odd so i will train him i'll show him how to go for battle he can come here at any time he can ask me questions i will mentor him and when when i die i let him come and sit on the throne could god have done it he could have done it but saul had other plans and so you know his king he he was killed his kingdom was broken his children nobody even bothered about him everything was gone so when we are filled with the holy spirit remember that the holy spirit can discern our hearts as teachers we we may not be able to discern the holy spirit is there are things in our life we feel okay this is not right the holy spirit may be speaking to you right now itself get rid of this this is not good in your life but we have two options one is we can be like saul and say no he did this to me or she did this to me or this is a sin which nobody knows i like the book of revelations it says our life is like an open book in front of him nothing is hidden from his frame Psalms one thirty nine, nothing is hidden from his frame. We can hide it for some time, maybe one year, five years, ten years, but it will eventually come out. So, let us learn to be like the disciples who are willing to go back to God, ask forgiveness, change their lives, and move on. So we see this example here: the Holy Spirit. Was searching people's heart. Okay, verse eight, chapter eight, verse twenty-nine to thirty-nine. Right now, this is again Philip and the Ethiopian. Now we talked about this a little bit, right? Uh, where two things happen here, two supernatural things through the Holy Spirit. Let's read that twenty-six onwards. Acts eight twenty-six onwards. Go ahead. No, no, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Saying, arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, who had charge for us a treasury, and had come to came to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in the chariots, he was reading. Ashaya the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, "Go near and overtake the chariot." So Philip ran to the him and heard him reading the prophet Ashaya and said, "Do you understand what you are reading?" And he said, "How can I unless someone guides me?" Yeah, yeah. And let's let's stop there. So we know the whole story. What happened there, right? Now I want to pick up a few things here. Philip was the known as the evangelist in the New Testament, right? In the New Testament church, he was the only person. Known as the evangelist. Now, Philip is in Samaria. Then he goes on. He's going from Samaria. He's going on the desert road, Jerusalem to Gaza. Verse twenty-six. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, "Everyone say, angel of the Lord." Now, that itself is a supernatural thing. The angel of the Lord came and said to Philip, "Go." Go south of the road. So he started off, right? Then let's go to uh, verse 
28 and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet the spirit told Philip go to the chariot and stay near it now everyone say spirit told the first one was he saw the angel of the Lord said and here the spirit told him go to the chariot and so he was there so two phenomena two supernatural phenomena has already happened right so he goes to the chariot and what does he do he begins to ask the person what are you reading i'm reading isaiah do you understand what it is he says no how can i how can i understand if nobody explains it to me so philip goes in and begins to explain to him the scriptures and towards the end he brings everything pointing to jesus to the messiah right uh, so one more thing that we can see towards the end when verse 38 and he gave orders to stop the chariot then both philip and the eunuch went down into the water and philip baptized him when they came up out of the water the spirit of the lord suddenly took philip away and the eunuch did not see him again but went on his way rejoicing the third phenomena there were three supernatural phenomena and one natural thing that God used through, a, through the person of Philip. First one, the angel of the Lord told Philip. Two, then the spirit told him, go to the chariot. Three, after they were baptized, the Holy Spirit took Philip and transported him to another place. The eunuch didn't see him again. But what is also important is, the Holy Spirit didn't tell Philip what message to preach. He was reading the book of Isaiah, but the Holy Spirit gave Philip the wisdom, the spirit of understanding. Okay, he's reading on this Isaiah. So I need to explain it in a way and point it to Jesus. And he was able to do that. How do we know that? Because when he pointed it to Jesus, finally he said, now, how can I, what should I do to get baptized? He says, there's water here. Can I be baptized here? So you see the balance of the supernatural and the natural. Let me give you an example. If I say, okay, Vinay, for example, Vinay, Vinay, come uh, tomorrow, you preach. We all will sit here and you preach a one hour sermon. So Vinay goes back home. He, he, he prays. He says, God, give me a word. What, what should I speak about? The Holy Spirit just puts in his heart, I want to speak about faith. Example, right? So he prepares. Now, the angel of the Lord is not sitting next to him and telling him, okay, put point number one. No. He's doing it on his own. Right? He is reading. He is trying to figure out. And he's making those points. Right? But through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, he's done all of it. He's prepared the sermon. And then he goes back and he says, now, Lord, I've done what you, you know, I prepared the sermon. Tomorrow I'm going to preach. So, Lord, you have to speak through me. People are going to listen to the sermon. I don't know what they are going through. I don't know what problems they are going through, what challenges they are going through. I don't know anything. So, Lord, when I preach, let the words, let the Holy Spirit speak through these words and minister to people. Uh, he's praying. He's spending time in prayer. And then he'll come on Sunday. I'm oh, sorry, on that day tomorrow. And he begins to preach. And he's preaching things that is we've heard maybe 100 times. But the Holy Spirit is speaking in different ways to all of us. Right? So you see the natural and you see the supernatural. And then he says, okay, let's close and pray for healing. If those of you who need healing believe we've heard about faith, Believe that God can bring healing. So you're tapping into the supernatural again. Everyone get what I'm saying? Yeah. Right? So we need to balance our ministry with both. Don't say only word, no supernatural. No. There's both. Word, natural, and the supernatural. I'll give you this example, beautiful example. In the miracles that Jesus did, he said, okay, there's no wine. What did Jesus say? You go 
fill the water pots with fill the pots with water did jesus go and say come i'll help you fill it he said you go fill it and i will turn it into wine if you don't fill i will not turn it to wine then he goes to lazarus's tomb he says you move the stone and i will bring lazarus back from the dead jesus didn't say okay push push the stone away we have to raise up lazarus time up three days over no he was standing there he said you you move the stone then i'll raise lazarus if you are not moving the stone if you go on saying no he's dead he's dead he's dead i'll go you move the stone i will raise him from the dead you fill the water pots i'll change it into wine so what is the principle here you and i have to do something to see the supernatural we do something in the natural we will see the supernatural you go back you prepare your sermon you prepare you pray you plan you do everything you come and preach god will do the miracles god will do the supernatural now if i'm not doing the natural still god is gracious he will still do the supernatural but then i have not done my part there's no reward for me you get what i'm saying yes everyone with me so we see that here very beautifully it's happening here okay let's go to acts 9 acts 9 17 and 18 introduces the great champion ambassador apostle paul chapter 9 verses 17 and 18 And Ananias went his way and entered the house, laying his hand on him. He said, "Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has you sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit." Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose, was baptized. Yeah, look at this, wonderful, right? You got this man Ananias. He's minding his own business, but God, the Lord Jesus comes and. Have you ever wondered why God chose? You see, the Lord Jesus, how He chooses people, obscure people, simple people, to do big works. He chose Barnabas and said, "Go bring Paul later on. Go bring Paul from uh, Tarsus to Antioch." Yeah, why didn't He choose Peter? Peter could have gone with his full team there. Oh, Peter and James and all those disciples there standing there. He's going to be the next prophet, the great apostle Paul. He's going to be a light to the Gentiles. So let's stand around him and pray, and and supernaturally God is going to release His power and He'll be able to see. No. Goes to a simple man, Ananias, and says, Ananias, listen, I've got a plan. What's the plan? The plan is you have to go to Straight Street. There's a man named Saul of Tarsus. Now Ananias is saying, "Hey, God, Jesus, if in in case you didn't know, Saul is killing all the Christians. You want me to go there? No, 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 no. Don't worry. I have chosen this man to be a light to the Gentiles. So you go, you pray with him, and he will receive his sight. He's blind, and he's praying to me, and so." you go and do what i'm telling you to do now not only the miracle is great but look at the other side of the story ananias is probably sitting and doing his night prayer normal prayer and jesus himself comes and talks to him gives him the word you do this direction directly from the lord jesus go here you will find this person his name is saul he is blind he is praying to me i have chosen him to be the light to the gentiles do you do we see something similar here in the old testament yes we do if you go back to i think it's first samuel and uh, samuel is going to anoint the first king of israel so forget the passage uh, but i can give it to you later uh, yeah i'll give it to you later i i I can tell you the chapter later, but Sam in First Samuel, um, Samuel is going to pro- go and anoint the first king of Israel, that is Saul. So he gives a prophetic word. He says, "Saul, 
Saul is searching for his father's donkeys. Now Saul is minding his own business. He's saying, oh, my donkeys are gone. My father's going to really get upset with me. I can understand his situation. And he's looking for his donkey. Suddenly Samuel is coming and saying, okay, Saul, here's what you do. When you go to this, when you go straight, you'll find two people. Then you go among those two people, one person will give you bread. You take the bread, you eat that bread, you keep going further on. You'll find another person. And then you will see that you will find your donkeys. And when you see that, no, you will find a group of people who are singing and praising God. You will join them and the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be anointed the next king of Israel. Saul is saying, I just want my donkeys. I don't want to become king of Israel and all. That was not in his mind. I have to take my donkeys home. Samuel is saying, no, 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 forget your donkeys. Your donkeys are safe. You are chosen to be the first king of Israel. Your name is going to go down on the records. Good and bad. But it's going to go down. You're going to become famous. Forget about your donkeys. You see the word of knowledge operating so beautifully here. And so here, the Holy Jesus ministers. And he goes. And what does he say, Ananias? He doesn't start speaking in tongues and saying prophesying and you know he didn't take his guitar there and start singing. No. Simple thing. He went there, he said, the Lord told him. Okay, well, where are we? Um, yeah, verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. What a word of knowledge. What a, this also brings the impartation of the Holy Spirit here. The same Jesus you met on the road to Damascus, where you saw that light and you fell at, his, at your feet blind, that same Jesus that appeared to you has sent me to you to tell you that to pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be anointed of God. You see that simple. Do we hear of Ananias after that? Nothing. There is no Ananias after this at all. But he did a very, very important task. So many lessons we can learn. The Holy Spirit can use simple people to do big tasks. I can, he can, and he can also use do big tasks through big people. Well, he can do it his way, right? And we see that Ananias obeyed God, and because of his obedience, the apostle Paul launched out. Meaning he was he was brought into faith. He received the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit. It says, and the great man apostle Paul was full of the Holy Spirit. I can only picture what he did after that. Remember, he, his eyes are restored and he says, now I can see not only physically, but I can also see spiritually all that I did, all the people that I've killed and the wrong things I've said. Now I understand. He gets baptized and then he goes 15 days. He's in Jerusalem. He goes to the desert after that for about three years. And we see this man getting launched into a Powerful ministry, writing two-thirds of the New Testament. How did it all start? Jesus said, go pray for this man. I'm going to do, use him for the kingdom. Right? Simple tasks. Big tasks. Simple people. And that's how God works. So we also, as we minister, as we are in ministry, don't always be looking out for the big people. God can use the small ones. God can use the simple ones to do big works. Amen? Right? Because in our, in our mind, it's always, okay, who's the next prophet? Who's coming on TV? Who's the next evangelist? Who's the next, uh, you know, all these things. Just learn to be simple in ministry. You don't have to put up a big show. It's not, it's, it's nothing. Ministry is very simple. Right? You don't have to put up a show. Just do what you have to do. Trust in God's word. Be simple. Do a simple bit. I don't have to, you know, I remember this one time. We were in, uh, I was in Punjab. 
It's a funny story, but it, was, it just taught me so much, so many lessons. Punjab, and then uh, it was a two-day conference, pastors' conference, and uh, so I went there, and then I went to the first row. They said because I was teaching, me and another person was scheduled to teach, so we were taking turns. So morning session, and then evening session, somebody else, and then uh, this other, you know, apostle or something. His name is. So they asked me, "What's your name?" I said, "My name is Paul Emmanuel." Are you pastor, prophet? I said, I don't know all that. You just put Paul Emmanuel. So, you know, they they were making a banner or something. So they, so I reached there and we, we were there on the first. I was there on the first row, and the worship had started. All of a sudden, people started screaming and clapping and shouting. So I was a little bit disturbed. So there are about three hundred odd people sitting there. So I was a little bit disturbed, and I saw this guy. He's apparently an apostle or something. He's worn sunglasses and a jacket, and he's got some two, three people around him. One is carrying his Bible, one is carrying his water bottle, another one is carrying his laptop, and he's walking in. And people are throwing flowers on him. People are bursting balloons and all of that. Us, what is happening? I thought he's getting married, but he came and he came and he stood next to me. When he came and stood next to me. There was so much of perfume smell, I couldn't breathe. Terrible perfume smell. Right? He's put, finished one, emptied one whole bottle of perfume, and he's come there and he's not removing his specs. So I really wanted to ask him, is it hot inside the auditorium? But anyways, he was wearing. It. And then he said hello and all that. He said, and I was concentrating on the worship. Then he he, you know, he called the coordinators aside and they called me as well. He said. Uh, you know, there's a problem. I said, "What is the problem?" He doesn't. Uh, you know, he's upset. Why is he upset? His photo is not in the banner. Now, see, I was young. I got really upset. But what? What did he say? The photo is not in the banner, so he wants a banner with the photo. Only then he'll come and preach. I said, "Send him home." I said, no, no, Pastor, we can't send him home. I said, you send him home. I will do all the sessions. Tell him we do, send him back. I will book his flight ticket. But the organizers are saying, oh, how can we do that? He's a famous man. I said, I don't care. Doesn't matter. He can be famous wherever he wants to be. He is not famous here right now. That's for sure. These people have come to hear the gospel. Many people are need healing, need the word. Many people are going through many problems. They don't need to deal with all this. Send them home. I said, take my card, book a ticket for him, send him home. And the walk is quite stern, but they took him. They said, see, we can't do all that. We're going to send you home. And he was so upset. He said, who is this small boy telling me? How old are you? You know, how long are you in ministry? I said, I'm 25 years old. I'm in ministry for three years, but I've not seen anything like this. So you can go home. I'm 25. I'll stand for the whole day. Three days, I'll do the whole thing. We had it. First day, we were 350 people. Next day, it became 400. We ended the last day, we were 600 people. All this, all, all we did. Nobody's poster was there. Nobody's banner was there. God did healing. God did miracle. Everything happened. This guy calling me. Oh, I'm very sorry for the way I behaved. I said, next time, don't do that. You may be the biggest pastor in the world. It doesn't matter. What matters is this is a conference. This is a meeting. We will preach the word of God. That remains constant. You come in blazer. You come in t-shirt. I don't know. But you be simple. You try. Your, your, our responsibility is to preach the word of God. That's it. And expect God to work miracles. Follow, follow it up with the supernatural. So many things that have happened like this. Now, I normally don't do these kind of things, but I had to do it that day. And I still talk to him. I, I, friend, you know, I have a good relationship with him. But these are things that happen. Putting up a show, it's not required at all. Okay, So we see that it was a simple ministry, yet a powerful ministry. OK, Acts 10, Acts 10, 19. Everyone with me? Yeah. Is it too much? 
Okay. Okay. We'll just go quickly. We'll not go into all those verses. Acts 10, Cornelius is, uh, you know, uh, is a, uh, a Roman Italian regiment, uh, and he's a Gentile, but God gives Peter uh, through a vision, right? And we know that vision, right? So you can read that Cornelius. Uh, so Peter sees a vision, and there are all kinds of animals that are there, and and the Spirit says, take what you want and eat. How can I eat something that is unclean? And then there's a principle that comes out from here. It's not what goes in your mouth that's unclean. Uh, sorry, it's not what comes out that is unclean. Is that, is that what it is? Simon, the... No, how can you call what... I have called clean. How can you call it unclean? Meaning, these guys are Gentiles, and you're calling them unclean, but I made them clean. This is after the cross. So Peter understood that dream, that vision, and he went and he prayed. And the response to that is they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Cornelius and his family were filled with the Holy Spirit. And because of this, they ended up saying, God is not a God of favoritism. The gospel can go into the Gentiles as well. Again, we see a powerful work of the Holy Spirit. Then in verse Acts 13, Barnabas and Paul are sent off to do their ministry. And they're again filled with the Holy Spirit. In the whole of Acts 13, that is uh, the first missionary journey, we see that they went about doing miracles. They planted churches, about five churches in Galatia, right? Uh, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, uh, Pisidian, Antioch, and uh, they, they went and planted churches filled with the Holy Spirit, touching many lives. Acts 14, sorry, Acts 15, the council in Jerusalem. Again, this council was very important because in this council, they were deciding whether the Gentiles have to be circumcised or if they believe in Jesus, it, is that more than enough? So that was the problem. So now James, who is Jesus' half-brother, right, is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. They make a decision. Okay. Paul also says, you know what? We went into the first missionary journey. We saw many Gentiles becoming, receiving the Holy Spirit and walking in, uh, you know, speaking in tongues and doing all these great things. So the, they were all not baptized. They were not circumcised. So we don't need circumcision. End of Acts 15, they say, okay, even the Gentiles are called into the kingdom of God and they don't have to get circumcised. So again, the wisdom of God. We see the Holy Spirit bringing peace among the Jews and the Gentiles. Right? There were two different groups. They hated each other. But now there was peace. There was some sense of unity that was coming in. And God was able to bring that. Um, at 16, uh, we see that Paul moves on in his first missionary journey. What's wonderful in Acts 16 that we want to read is Paul and Silas are in, uh, you know, they are in Philippi, Paul and Silas, we all know this. They're in Philippi, and they've been beaten severely and flogged and put into the prison. Look at this. Verse 22 onwards, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrate ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they were, had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell, fastened their feet with stock. Now look at this. One, they've been beaten and flogged severely. That means they're wounded, they're bleeding, they're in pain. And then they're taken to an inner cell and their feet was chained. Not only could they stretch their legs and, you know, they were chained. Miserable situation. What did they do? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Look at that. I read this every time I read this, I say, God, I get goosebumps. My hair stands on my head. They were beaten and flogged and put in chains. About midnight, they were fast asleep. What were they doing? Singing and they had many, 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 many reasons not to sing and praise God. Number one, Jesus, you said full-time ministry. Now, I've come into full-time ministry, not when one year is over, I'm sitting in prison. Two is, I'm old. 
I'm not a young man and I've got beaten. And full body aches everywhere. And three years, you put me in prison with chains here. Nobody is there to help me. What is happening? What kind of ministry have you called me into? No, 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 no. They were singing and praising God. And because of that, what, suddenly there was a violent earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken. At once the prison doors flew open and everybody's chain came loose. Imagine this. There was a violent earthquake. The prison walls came crumbling down. The chains broke. The gates flew off. But nothing happened to them. They were standing. No chains. Can you picture this? What a work of the Holy Spirit. Supernatural. And because of this, the jailer comes and says, you are, there's something different among you. And they, he gives his life to Christ. His whole family gives his, their lives to Christ. And they come and they nurse his wounds. Oh, it's a beautiful story. What happened? They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to sing and pray to God. In our seasons of, you know, hurt and pain, this is what we can go to. No need to tell God this, 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 this. These are my, all my problems. Just say, God, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you. I know you have a plan. I know you have a way. And I know you'll get me out of, the, out of this problem. You will do it your way. I don't understand how is it, but I will trust in you. You will see God working even more powerfully in our lives. Right? So we go on again, Acts 18, he's in Corinth. Acts 19, Paul is in Ephesus. Oh, this was beautiful. In Ephesus, you know, one day, verse 19, verse 14, seven sons of Sceva, a, a Jewish chief priests were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the demons overpowered these. So again, we see great fear sees the people. Don't try to imitate something when you can't follow it. Don't try to imitate people. Don't try to imitate what people do. It is the anointing of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We can't pretend. You've got to have it. If you have it, you have it. It will show. It will be manifested. If you don't have it, don't have a pretense. It's not going to be of any use. Right? So we see this all through Acts 20, Acts 21 as well. We see that the Apostle Paul in his ministry, through the full, you know, through the anointing and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he was able to plant many churches. He was able to walk in the supernatural. He was able to, you know, later on he says, I went up to the third heavens and I saw certain things which I can't even explain to you. Right? He saw the supernatural. He saw healings, miracles. Paul writes in Corinthians and he says, what I receive from the Lord I give to you. Have you ever thought of that? Maybe Paul is sitting in Arabia and he's praying and suddenly Jesus is coming and saying, Paul, listen, you were not there when I did the, you know, when I prayed with the disciples. Listen, what I did. What I did was I took this bread, I gave thanks to it, I broke it, and I said, this is, he explains the whole thing to Paul. He says, what I received from the Lord, it was not Peter and John who was explaining to him. So we see that Paul walked in this level of, you know, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And you and I can also get there. But there's some things that we must do, right? So we'll stop here come to the end of this class we'll we'll stop here we'll get into chapter 6 uh next class All right thank you everyone uh, have a good weekend god bless